Seth, I've been somewhat obsessed with the concept of free will, and I've made the mistake of talking largely to philosophers. So I want you to tell me from a physics point of view, what can we learn about free will, assuming that the universe is predictable in some real sense underlying quantum mechanics in some way? You still believe there's a robust kind of free will? Well, I do believe that there's free will, Robert. But what I'm going to tell you should also be very useful for people who don't believe in free will. Um, there have been studies shown that 80% that of the people ask, say, if the universe is deterministic and mechanistic, so everything in, going on in our brains is completely mechanistic, can people have free will? And 80% of people say, no, you can't have free will. Okay, I'm in the 80%. Okay, but then you ask, you ask these peop same people, do you have free will? And 90% of them say, yeah, I have free will. Sure, yeah, sure. it's like they're drivers, right? You know, right. Everybody believes themselves to be an excellent driver. Right. Like, those Every other guys don't have free will. Everybody's <laughs> above average. <laughs> right, exactly. So what's going on here? All right. so, so why do people believe that they have free will? Um, so for a long time, in fact, for thousands of years, philosophers and scientists have said, oh, it's because there's some intrinsically chancy nature to the universe. In fact, if you go back to the teachings of Epicurus, the Greek philosopher, as reported by Lucretius in his beautiful poem, De Rerum Naturae, on the nature of things, he says, the motions of the atoms are completely deterministic as they fall through space and bounce off of each other, but every now and one of them uh, gives a slight swerve. Uh, and, and he's like, why, is, why this swerve? Then he goes on and says, well, why do they have to give a slight swerve? It's because if there were a slight swerve, then everything would be completely deterministic, and this wonderful thing that we call our freedom of will would not exist. Whereas, apparently, according to Lucretius, because some atom gives a slight swerve, which is then, a bit, I guess, amplified by our neurons into a decision, then we have free will, because we can't predict our decisions. And the way that they've done that is to assume as an assumption that we have free will and therefore interpreting what the physical world is. But the physical world had to be that way or we wouldn't have free will. Yeah. It's not examining the physical world and then asking whether free will is an illusion. So the, yeah. the, the analysis is the reverse from which we may do today. Well, that's because why they were called ancient Greek philosophers, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> this notion that like you know, the world, just because you think the world has to be a certain way, doesn't yeah. mean it is that way. This is a right. more modern, right. enlightenment right. kind of right. notion, right? right. So, so I think this is wrong. And you find this statement going through time up through the 20th century. In fact, after Newton, things got worse because Newton's laws are completely deterministic, so there's no swerve. So no swerve, and if you look at the philosophers of the Enlightenment, but like uh, people like David Hume, for instance, they're confronting this world where they believe everything is deterministic, and they say, well, how can we possibly have free will? And there are wonderful quotes from Boswell's Life of Samuel Johnson, where Johnson says these salty things like, you may think I don't have free will, but I get to decide when I'm going home, and I'm going home right now. <laughs> or, or he says, our will is free and there's an end to it. Or he says, all philosophy militates against free will, all experience for, right? Mm -hmm. Because everybody has the experience of free will. Everybody has the experience of, you have to make a decision, like a common one that I have, it's like, it's four o'clock in the afternoon, caffeinated or decaf, right? Well, caffeine would be a little more exciting. On the other hand, decaf would be a bit safer. I wonder, ah, let's go for the excitement, right? So, but before I make the decision, I don't know if I'm gonna have caffeinated coffee or decaffeinated coffee. So I claim this has nothing to do with the slight swerves of atoms and molecules, my inability to predict this. Instead, it has everything to do with the nature of thought and the nature of computation. So. In particular, if you ask what's going on there, I am asking a question about myself. What am I, Seth Lloyd, going to do in terms of my coffee choice right now? What has to happen? I have a physical dynamical system that's making a decision. So the decision caffeinated or decaf is going from the dynamics of the neurons in my brain. But at the same time, in order to ask the question of what am I going to do, I have to have a capacity for self-reference. I have some notion of an I, even a very primitive notion of, of I, what I, Seth Lloyd, am going to do. Um, now, there's a very beautiful result from the theory of logic called Gödel's theorem, which says that systems of mathematics that have the capacity for self-reference 
are inevitably incomplete. You can phrase questions in the context of the theory that the theory itself is incapable of answering. And when you translate this into computers, to systems that are actually processing information, then for computers, there are always questions that the computer can ask. You can phrase it in terms of the computer language, but the computer will not be able to answer. And there are these problems about self-reference. So for instance, if you could go to the operating system of my iPhone, right, and say, so, what's Siri going to be up to in five minutes' time? The operating system will tell me, I don't know, why are you asking me? How can okay. I predict? You know, even though, of course, it's completely up to the operating system of the iPhone, what Siri's going to be doing in five minutes' time, right? You know, but the operating system won't be able to answer it. Because the question, what are you going to be doing in five minutes' time, is exactly the kind of self-referential question that you can prove that computers are not going to be able to answer all the time. Now, even if we human beings have more capacity for thought than computers, and I have plenty of friends and colleagues and myself probably who have less mm -hmm. capacity for independent thought than Siri, for instance, um, even if you, you look at human beings and say they might be able to do things that computers can't, the very fact that you could describe their dynamics according to a physical law, which itself is computable, computable by on a computer, that means that there are questions that we can ask ourselves that we will not be able to answer. And the question of, am I going to have coffee or decaf, is one of those questions. Is your analysis the same for a, a, a sentient creature, human being as an example, and for a physical object like a computer? Is there any difference between the two. I'm very glad you brought that up, Robert, because I think one thing that people feel about free will is that it's innately bound up in our consciousness and you know that we're self-conscious beings with intelligence, blah 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 yeah. blah blah. Yeah. Right? And, and what I am saying to you here is that we don't need to have some really well-developed notion of consciousness or spirituality or you know even be that smart <laughs> to have this experience of free will. All we have to do to have the experience of free will is to be able to ask the question, what am I going to be doing? So I need to have a model for myself. I have to have enough self-reference to ask, what am I going to be doing? So when my smartphone, when I ask my smartphone, what is Siri going to be doing in five minutes time? It's according to the operating system of my smartphone. Siri is just a program, you know, program 37. So I'm saying, okay, five minutes down the line, a gajillion clock cycles down the line, what is program 37 going to be doing? It's just a numerical question. And right. the operating system says, to heck with you, buddy. I don't know, right? So and it has to go through the whole process to find out in there for its... its right, its, for it to find out, yeah. the, the, the simplest way to find out it's is just to do, do it. it, right? <laughs> and that's, in fact, how this proof, it's a mathematical proof, basically, that anything that has this capacity for self-reference won't know what it's going to be doing. What you prove is that the, the computation involves saying, gee, I wonder what I'm going to be doing five minutes down the line. Answering the question that way is a lot harder than just like saying, ah, oh, I'm just going to do it, you know? <laughs> so, so doing things is easier than asking yourself what you're going to do. And in this sense, there's no difference between a sentient creature and a, a non-biological entity. That's right. So computers definitely suffer from this free will problem. <laughs> if you take something like a thermostat, right? Okay, a thermostat's making decisions like, yeah. you know, is it, should I turn on the heat or should I like leave it off? But, you know, thermostat is sufficiently simple. It really has only two internal states. Like, is it too cold or is it okay? And then it gets information from the outside. Okay, 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 okay. Too cold. Oh, too cold. Click. Let's yeah. turn on the heat. All right. Now, Thermostat has only one bit of internal information, and that's not enough to model itself out of a paper bag. So yeah. the thermostat is not capable of asking the question, you know, what am I going to do? Whereas the operating system for your iPhone, the operating system itself, what is I? Well, the operating system is a program in the iPhone. It's program, let's say, series number 37. The operating system is program number one, because it like regards yeah. itself as number one. Right? Right. So when the the operating system is asking the question, what am I going to be doing? It doesn't have to be self-conscious. It just has to be able to say, what is program number one going to be doing five minutes down the line, right? And it itself, this program, is program number one. So it just has to have enough self-reference to be say, what is program number one going to do? And it will say, shut up, I'm busy. I don't know what I'm going to do, right? I mean, we'll give you the same answer, right? I think that we actually need a free will app for our iPhones so that we can you know, get them to explain why it is that they're not doing what we ask them to do.